Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andrew Nurk, and I'm the Deputy Director for Enrichment and Civic Engagement here at the Free Library, and it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Garth Greenwell. Garth Greenwell's new book, Cleanness, is the kind of book you really want people to read over your shoulder on the train. <laughs> you want everyone around you to be as buckled up in Greenwell's taught sentences as you are, and to see the layers and layers of queer pleasure and discomfort mapped in astonishing detail in these pages. And when your seatmate works up the courage to ask you what the book is about, you could say it's a cycle of nine stories about a gay American teacher living in Sofia, Bulgaria. But you'll probably want to say it's about cleanness. And by implication, it's opposite. The dream of being swept clean that becomes an unbearably hollowing wind the revolution that starts to look like a cleansing, molten desire that leaves behind large tracts of scar, or humiliation that becomes a reconstitution of the self, the disposable encounter that becomes indispensable to your life. As Dwight Garner wrote in the New York Times this week, every detail in every scene glows with meaning. It's as if while other writers offer data, Greenwell is providing metadata. In addition to cleanness, Garth Greenwell is the author of What Belongs to You, which won the British Book Award for debut of the year, and was long listed for the National Book Award, and was a finalist for six other awards, including the Penn Faulkner and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. A New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice, it was named Best Book of 2016 by over 50 publications in nine countries, and is being translated into a dozen languages. Garth Greenwell's fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, A Public Space, and Vice, and he has written criticism for The New Yorker, The London Review of Books, and The New York Times Book Review, among others. Garth will be joined in conversation tonight by a familiar friend of the Free Library, Carmen Maria Machado, most recently the author of the memoir In the Dream House, as well as Her Body and Other Parties. Please join me in welcoming Garth Greenwell and Carmen Maria Machado to the Free Library. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, how are y'all doing tonight? Um, <laughs> Thanks for being here. Yeah, Hi. thank you. It's so good to see all your shining faces um, on this windy evening. It's a windy evening. It is, it is, I know. It's like this weekend, it was so warm and then it got so cold and I'm like, we're all gonna die. <laughs> um, so I wanted to um, first begin the conversation by saying what a joy this book is. Um, it was so beautiful and so hot, and I was sort of, sort of in, in turn, like upset by it and moved mm. by it, and then turned on by it. And there was just so much. I just sort of love how you sort of move between these modes, even sometimes within a single mm. sentence. And it was just a real joy to me. Um, and oh, so I, <laughs> I want to start off by talking about something kind of basic, but that I selfishly have a lot of questions about, which is what it's like to be touring and to have written your second, like one second book, and what that means in terms of um, sort of your evolving relationship with your book, having like also by Garth Greenwell, <laughs> like, right. you know, in the, like what does it mean to now have a beautiful small body of work that is like more than one? Oh, I want, I want you to tell me all about that, Carmen, <laughs> actually. Um, you know, when I got the ARC, and I saw the, like, also by Garth Greenwell, there was something that was like, oh, I'm a real writer, you know, yeah. it's, um, yeah, it's an interesting question, you know, it's been very moving, the book just came out on Tuesday, um, and every day this week has been events, and it's moving to, um, you know, it, readers feel like they have a kind of relationship with the books, you know, and like, mm -hmm. they've been in the world of my writing for four years. You know, at the, the Harvard bookstore on Tuesday, um, there were people there who had been there in 2016 for What Belongs to You, and um, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. And then in terms of my own relationship, it's interesting. I guess, um, I don't know, you know? I mean, I feel like I learned so much and grew so much as a writer um, writing What Belongs to You and also writing cleanness. And it's interesting to sort of encounter um, on the page a voice that feels very different from the voice of the book that I've been reading from 
for four years, yeah. you know? And that's interesting, yeah, to yeah. sort of feel that difference. Do you feel like you're a, you're a I, this is a loaded thing I realize to say, but like a better writer than the writer who wrote the first book? I do, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's a better book. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a way in which, um, I mean, What Belongs to You is such an obsessively focused book. And, you know, I hope that that's a strength of it. But, um, you know, as I was writing it, I knew that the world of the book was much bigger than what would fit into it. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there was going to be this other container, even though I didn't know the shape of it for a long time. You know, Cleanness, I think, is a much more varied book, a much, um, you know, there are more characters. There are things that I couldn't do, I think. You know, What Belongs to You was a really good first exercise in fiction for a poet, um, in part because almost all of it's inside. And in cleanness, like, there are a lot of streets. There's a lot of movement around cities. There's a lot of bodies of people. And, you know, some of that came from, you know, I discovered after I wrote What Belongs to You that I read fiction really differently. Because all of my training had been in poetry. And um, I had always voraciously read novels. But I remember in the year after, or two years after um, What Belongs to You came out, I spent like six months obsessed with Zola obsessed with his crowd scenes and like reading them as a fiction writer, like sort of being like, well, how do you do this? Mm -hmm. And that allowed me to write parts of this book. You know, I do think I could just, there are more things I can do in this book, yeah. which is what you want, I think. I mean, I hope I feel that way with the next book. Yeah, I, I think there's something really interesting about being like, I feel like I, I can tackle something new and different and more yeah. now, like I've gotten stronger or yeah. I've gotten smarter and better and like I'm ready to like take on new like fictional challenges. Like for yeah. me, it's like historical fiction. Like I've been like thinking a lot about oh. research. Right, I know. <laughs> but I used to be like terrified and the idea of writing from research was like, I couldn't even imagine it. Like I couldn't even yeah. visualize it in my head. Sure. And now that's what I'm working on. You know? It's amazing. So there's something that's so exciting. funny about that. That's exciting. I mean, you process. know, it's, it's, it's an erotic experience yeah. really. An experience of kind of one's own expansion. I mean, I think like the most exhilarating part of falling in love is feeling one's sense of the world expand. Like, you know, when I met my partner, Luis, who is a Spanish poet, and all of a sudden this whole world of literature um, was sort of delivered to me, you know, mm -hmm. a sort of door opened and said, came in, and that was so exhilarating. And, you know, I feel that way in writing. And also, I mean, it's not just technical things like, how do you move people around a city in a protest march? Well, let's read Jeremy Nall and find out. I mean, it's not just that. It's also, I think, you know, um, you hope that you are, I, well, I guess I think that what it means to become a better writer is to sort of have challenged one's own um, moral limitations. I mean, I think what it means to make art, to make exciting art is always to have that particular kind of fierceness that is being at the very edge of your capacity. Yeah. And, you know, if that's where you live as an artist, then you hope that's constantly moving and that, you know, I, I mean, I do feel like, I mean, art is not for me a product, like art is not for me this object that I make and that is then static and external and in the world, it is instead like my way of engaging with the world. Like art is an action. I mean, art, like I write books because I want to think as deeply as I'm capable of and I want to engage as deeply as I'm capable of. And I do think like writing what belongs to you and then writing the nine sections of cleanness, I mean, I think um, I felt advances, which that's the wrong thing to say. Because, I mean, you aren't moving sort of for, but you're like dropping ever deeper into the abyss. Like that's <laughs> what it feels like. But I did feel that. Yeah. I feel like, I almost think of it as like, um, when one, like, like I remember like at some point in my life I was doing a lot of weightlifting and I could actually track like how much I could lift and right. like that number was changing. Yeah. I mean, not very fast, but right. like one week I'd be like, holy shit, last week I couldn't, lift this much and now I've li I can lift like 10 pounds more than last right. week yeah. and it's like this sudden awareness of your own strength yeah. where you're like I'm there's a change happening it's very minute but I'm suddenly aware of it 
Um, whereas like a lot of those things I think slip by your notice where you're not yeah. necessarily paying attention. But if you, that sense of like, ah, yes, like, yeah, like I'm gathering, like the capa- my capacity is like enlarged, has been made larger and like my mind has been deepened in some way, I think. And that's a know. deep pleasure. I mean, even mm-hmm. though it's, it's, you know, you feel that, but then immediately you're like, I'm stronger, so let me leap out further and oh, I'm lost again, you know? So, but there is that feeling. And yeah, I mean, I did have the experience writing the sections of this book and sometimes, and I felt that in What Belongs to You. I mean, I remember writing the second section of What Belongs to You and just feeling like I was sort of plummeting into this space. I had um, no idea how to navigate. I had no idea if I could come back from, which I do think art does. You know, I mean, I do think there is a kind of existential peril in art, making art. I mean, the history of art is full of people who go into the abyss and don't come back. It's part of the gratitude I feel to artists, the gratitude that I feel to someone like Frank Bedart, who has been going into the abyss for 50 years and bringing us back what he finds there. Um, You know, I had the experience writing some of the scenes of this book. You know, the, the, the scene, the section that really brought the book into being for me, it wasn't the first that I wrote, but it was the first that I wrote after What Belongs to You, and it was the first that I wrote after moving back to America. I wrote it in Iowa City. I remember so clearly the table in high ground I sat at every morning as I wrote. And it's this, what's now the second chapter, which is called Gospodar, and which is a very intense, scary um, story. And I remember feeling really a kind of terror about that and a sense that if I am going to write this, then I have to go beyond what feels safe to me, yeah. you know? And I do think um, there is a certain kind of art, and it's an art that I value, that demands that. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> the, um, sorry, and now I have to like transition to another question, and I'm like, I don't even. I'm like, my brain is still like chewing over. Um, I'm still thinking about weightlifting. I know, God. Like, wow. um, well, I guess, I guess, sort of like to con- have a body. I don't know. <laughs> It's so nice and so scary. Um, <laughs> Uh, I feel like, so I guess, speaking of the abyss, I, I was thinking a lot, actually, is it, and can you say it, gos, is it Gospodar? Yeah, Gospodar. Gospodar um, was a story that was one of my favorites in the book, mm. and um, there's this, the final line of the story um, is really beautiful and really sort of took me somewhere else, which is, um, which is so it's a story about a, a narrator who has not having a sexual encounter, it's very erotic, it's very tender, and it's very violent. And the final line of the story is, for some moments I wrestled with these thoughts, then I stood and turned to the back to the boulevard, composing as best I could my human face. Um, and I was thinking a lot about how reading this book in particular, also your first book as well, but I feel like this one's especially, like I was sort of, there was sort of this like horizon of meaning and you're sort mm. of dipping back and forth sort of on this like upper level that's very sort of like bodily and very sort of concrete and is sort of dealing with, um, sort of language and philosophy and the body and sex, and then you sort of dipping into these, uh, this under this under place, and it's like where language fails and philosophy fails, yeah. um, and sort of gives way from like just sexual encounters to like this sort of erotic encounter. Um, and I, I'm just sort of curious like what, so in terms of like <laughs> pulling you into the abyss, or like yeah. what do you feel like sort of draws you to that, that horizon, that boundary, like where you're sort of moving between these, and I feel like you do it, and again, you sort of do it like even within a single sentence, but I'm, I feel like Constance sort of pulls back and forth in that way. And that line about sort of being on the street after this encounter and then like composing one's human face, yeah. you know, just felt so like, like a person who is also shifting between, in the, is in this liminal space and on this threshold. So mm. can you sort of speak to that, I guess that aesthetic or that, that interest for you? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of this book is about intense experience. A lot of this book is about um, intense sexual experience, erotic experience. You know, um, the title of the book, Cleanness. Um, you know, in some ways is about a kind of ideal that I think exerts a lot of power over us. The desire to be clean, the desire to be pure. 
whenever I think about human life, it seems to me, and this is just a given to me of the world, it's not something I argue myself into or out of, it's just the world as it appears to me, that whenever I look at human life, I see a series of double binds. It is just a fact for me that there is something in us that longs to be clean and that there is something in us that longs to bathe in filth. That is just part of the equipment of the human to have these desires that are irreconcilable. And I feel like whole systems of thought and philosophy and disciplines of the body have been established to try to protect us from one or the other of those impulses. I think that that is an endeavor that will always fail, that repression never leads to any real positivity, that if we become obsessed with a notion of our own cleanness and a, if we become addicted to the idea of ourselves as pure, that we will turn ourselves into engines of devastation. In this book, I wanted to see, I wanted to explore how maybe one might refuse to accept that double bind, how maybe one might um, try to find a life that could allow for some, that could make that double bind not simply an impasse, but in some way make it productive. You know, this tormenting double bind. To make it productive of beauty, to make it productive of solidarity, to make it productive of pleasure. Sex for me, is an experience in which these contradictions of the human are especially vividly felt. You know, um, talking about the abyss, talking about this kind of horizon of meaning, you know, I think there is something in us, and in this book, again and again, people say things like, I want to be nothing, or I want to be a whole. I want to be, I want to be used. I want to be an object. I wanted to experiment and explore an intuition that I have, and an intuition that I think is deep in traditions of queer thinking, that says if one is not frightened of that in us which desires negation, which again is something that I think is just part of the human equipment. I think there is something in us that wants not to be. If instead of trying to shut that down, to shut down, affirma to shut down negation with a kind of coerced affirmation, what if instead one went as far as one could in negation, say in something like the aesthetic experience that is an S&M scene? What if one did that? Is there a way that somehow one might find in that abyss of negation a kind of affirmation? That's sort of the promise. You know, I'm really interested in this tradition of queer thinking that sees in sort of radical, non-normative, there's no good way to say it, sex. Um, a kind of the possibility of a radical new sense of sociality, a radical new sense in which, you know, as if the self, if we get to a point where we say, I want to be nothing, and where we are made nothing and the self is broken, as in extremely ascetic experience, then maybe on the other side of that, there's some other self that can relate to in which we can relate to each other in a new way. 
that's sort of the promise of um, the companion piece to Gospodar, the little saint. Yeah. Anyway. I was just gonna, and I was just about to like reference the little, the little saint. So this is another story which has um, is almost entirely structured around a a, a blowjob scene, um, which I got to <laughs> heard you read from at some point, and I absolutely <laughs> loved. Um, and it's 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 stunning. And there's this this bit in the story where, um, and I would have to read it, but it's long enough that I think we should keep talking. And sure. but but just to explain it, the narrator is sort of thinking during this act. He thinks about this girl that he knew as a young when he was young, um, this sort of larger girl who. Um, or this, this fat girl who um, the kids would sort of make fun of and tease, but like actually they all wanted to have sex with her and she would have sex with them and right. it gave her this sense of power and the sense, and she got to like tap into her own desires and she sort of taught him the ways of like basically taking what you want and like having desire and like acting, acting on your desire. And it's a really beautiful passage and I, I actually was re I was looking through the book today as I was preparing and um, read, reread that passage many, multiple times because it's just mm. it's so beautiful. It's one of my favorites in the entire book. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Thank you. And I, I feel like there's something to be said about I, the, the phrase I wrote on my page is the poetics of sluthood, which I don't know if that's very useful. Oh, yeah, that's very um, useful. <laughs> but, that's very useful. But sort of thinking about ways in which desire and intention supersede shame and, and rules. And, and I feel like thinking about that as like, is, and I was like, and I wrote, is that queerness? Even though one of the characters in this in that passage isn't necessarily queer, but I was like, is that what queerness is? Is that sort of level of intention and desire superseding shame? Like, is that, oh, or I is love that, that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, but so it's sort of this, I wanted in this book to try like not to say no to anything. Mm -hmm. Any of these parts, like our desire to be clean, our desire to bathe in filth, our desire to sort of assert ourselves, our desire to be nothing. Like what if, what if one refused any of those ideologies that try to shut down one half of these dichotomies? Mm -hmm. You know, shame and pride. Like, I think queer experience has been radically structured by rhetorics of shame and of pride, and by experiences of shame and rhetorics of pride. You know, I grew up in a place, Kentucky, in the late 80s, where I was taught a single lesson about my life as a queer person, which was that my life lacked value and my, lack, my life lacked dignity. I, after 30 years, steeped in activism, after 30 years of queer community, 30 years of queer art making, queerness is the source of everything I value in my life. Queerness is the source of extraordinary joy I would never choose not to be queer. I know that lesson, those lessons I was taught. I know those lessons are false. But I will never get to be someone who was not taught those lessons. I will never get to be someone who was not in some fundamental way shaped by shame. The rhetoric of pride that has been so much of the public life of queer people in this country is essential and life-saving. When I was 14 years old in Louisville and I saw a pride parade for the first time, that was radical, affirming, and necessary. But if a rhetoric of pride means that we can't acknowledge, that we have to repress, that we have to deny, that we have to turn away from shame, mm -hmm. well, not only do I think that's a recipe for disaster because repression always just builds up a greater explosion of what we're trying to repress. I also think it's a great denial of the extraordinary things that shame can do. You know, the whole history of queer art is taking stigma and turning it into style. The whole history of queer politics is taking stigma and turning it into solidarity. One of the histories of queer desire is taking stigma and turning it into pleasure. And if I think of a word like faggot, which when my father found out I was gay, he said to me what the narrator's father says to the narrator and what belongs to you. He said, if I had known you were going to be a faggot, you would never have been born. That word lacerated me. That word was a kind of scar. 
If now I can create an aesthetic frame around an experience of sociality, say an experience of sex, in which a man calling me a faggot gives me access to a kind of rapture I can access in no other way. That seems to me an extraordinary technology of survival. If I can take the language of my father and not deny it, not demand it never be spoken, but make it useful, then that doesn't seem to me simply that I have internalized the hatred of my father and am perpetuating it. It feels to me instead like a kind of triumph. So that's a way in which, you know, these things that we think of as negative, things that we want to be clean of, things that we want to be purged of, what if instead we try to see what they can do? Um, thank you. Yes, oh. thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> your background is in singing. It is. And before you wrote prose, you wrote poetry, I which did. you mentioned earlier. Can you talk about the sort of way in which those practices fed each other yeah. or, or made, made, made the others difficult or sort of what their relationship is with each other. Yeah, you know, it's funny because, I mean, I guess now I'm a fiction writer. Like, I guess, <laughs> what does that I mean? guess like that's how I identify. <laughs> you know, it's funny, Andrea Lawler, the, I, I mean, it's kind of wonderful this time on book tour. One thing that's different about book tour this time is I said I want it to be in conversation with people I admire and love. And, um, so like my book tour is just this like circuit of iconic geniuses. Like one, <laughs> one day I'm with Andrea Lawler, one day I'm with Garvin Machado. I mean, it's like what a luxury, right? Although also like what an astonishing moment of queer literature we are in, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, what an astonishing, someone asked me at, at the Harvard bookstore, someone was like, when do you think the renaissance of the queer novel will finally happen? What? And I was like, <laughs> Like, I was like, me. look around, like, what are you talking about? You know, it, but that was interesting, too, yeah. because I was like, oh, right, we are so used to a mindset of scarcity that we cannot see the abundance that surrounds us, yeah. you know? Um, but, yeah, so I guess I'm a fiction writer, but really I don't feel like a fiction writer. You know, I identify much more as a poet, even though I don't write poetry anymore. And everything I am as a writer comes from the fact that my introduction to the arts was music and was opera, which was not just my introduction to the arts. So funny story, um, you know, so that, that trauma of my father disowning me, kicking me out of the house, as a result of that, I failed freshman English in high school. And um, it was as a result of that, and for arcane reasons having to do with the public Kentucky school I was in, um, I needed like an extra credit, and so I had to enroll in choir. Um, and I enrolled in choir, I remember so clear, I can hear like my 14 year old voice saying in my head, that will be easiest, because I was like <laughs> the laziest student. Um, you know, so I enrolled in choir, and in this public high school in Kentucky, there was an astonishing, brilliant man named David Brown, a brilliant singer, and a kind of unbelievably generous man who heard something in my voice and started giving me voice lessons after school. First, that was the first time an adult had ever treated me as though my life might have value, so that was revolutionary. But second, when he taught me how to sing in a kind of classical way, you know, which means singing with your whole body, the sound that emerged was so much bigger than anything I had thought I might contain. Like it suggested like a scale of myself I had never suspected. And then he gave me CDs of opera, he gave me opera videos, he gave me tickets to the Kentucky Opera, 
And opera, you know, that was, first of all, opera was the opposite. I was, my family were tobacco farmers. I was first generation raised off the farm, but we spent a lot of time on the farm, and the life of the farm was very much a part of my life. And opera was the opposite of a tobacco farm. <laughs> and, you know, a tobacco farm, clearly, there was no place for me there. But opera, there was. You know, there was a place for my body. You know, like, you know, queer kids know very early on that gender is a system of violence and that it's a system of violence that requires constant policing. And faggy boys, you know, my father, whenever he saw a trace of fagginess in me as a baby, as a kid, he would beat me. He would say, don't be, a, don't be girly, be a man. I remember like sitting on my hands so that I wouldn't make a gesture, you know, I like to use my hand, so that I wouldn't make a gesture that would enrage my father. My body was too big. My emotions were too big. I was always crying. I was always feeling too much. Well, opera gave me a context in which I was just the right size and in which, you know, this self that was totally incomprehensible in the world of my childhood was legible, made sense, was part of a system of meaning that had a kind of obvious value, which was beauty. And, you know, that, so in that sense, you know, opera, poetry, novels, it's all continuous. I mean, it's all this attempt to have beauty serve as a way to make meaning from my life. Um, I heard a rumor that you're working on a new project set in Kentucky, that your next project will be there. Um, and I mean, your last two books have been set in Sofia. Obviously, this is a, oh, I just read, did I get louder all of a sudden? Um, <laughs> uh, your last two books have been set uh, in Sofia, and so this is a, obviously a really different setting for you. And I was wondering what it feels like to sort of turn your, is, are the characters of that book American, like the protagonists of that book? So you're sort of moving from like an, you know, an expat or a person like living in a country that's not their own to people living like sort of local, local queers, local right? Local queers. Um, and so Absolutely. I guess what is that, what is that like? Like what is it like to, um, I guess like turn your eyes sort of back in that direction and yeah. back to where you came from and yeah. Well, so, I mean, this was actually maybe the biggest gift. So, What Belongs to You, my first novel, changed my life in every way. Um, maybe the most profound way it changed my life was that on book tour, the publi my publisher wanted me to do an event in Louisville. I had not been to Louisville in 15 years. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, you know, I ran away. I, I escaped when I was 16, and it really felt like I escaped. And I went back as seldom as possible. And, you know, I felt like um, Kentucky was a place that was determined to kill me, which I think when I, when I was a kid it was. That was how I experienced it. And I also felt that it was a place I knew everything I ever needed to know about it. There was no, there was nothing to be curious about. Well, when I went back, and I ended up spending about a week, and I was able to go back because my father retired and moved to Florida. So he was no longer in the city, and that meant I could kind of go there. It was possible. Um, my two younger sisters were living there at the time. I love them. They are fabulous, brilliant, arty, vibrant people with friends that have all of those qualities. Louisville has changed a lot in the last 15 years, or uh, the last 20 years since I was a kid. Um, I couldn't believe the city that they showed me. Mm -hmm. I also couldn't believe how moved I was to be in a place, because since I was 16, I had moved basically every two years. To be in a place where I could say, oh right, I remember being here when I was five. Like to have, there, that meant something to me that I didn't expect. So through a sort of, I became interested in Louisville. I felt like actually this was a place I didn't know at all. 
And in fact, I felt the kind of chemical reaction to Louisville that I felt with Sophia, which was the last thing I thought I would feel, because that's the kind of thing that makes me think, I need a book to think about this place. <laughs> and then I discovered that the University of Louisville, there's a thing called the Williams Nichols Archive, which is one of the largest regional LGBT historical archives in the country. And I thought, what history? What LGBT history? Which is, of course, so dumb. <laughs> because queer people are everywhere and queer history is everywhere. But there has been such a devastating campaign to stamp that out. And when I was 13, 14, and desperately needed it, the whole world was organized in such a way to keep me from it. But I spent weeks in this archive, going every day, and discovering the most astonishing things. Discovering that in the early 90s, when I was not far away, there were heroic queer activists. There were heroic activists mobilizing around and against the AIDS crisis and the indifference of America in the face of it. But I also discovered more. I discovered, for instance, I had no idea Oscar Wilde went to Kentucky in the 1880s. <laughs> Oscar Wilde, you know, before he was famous, right? So Oscar Wilde was not famous in the UK. So he went to America and did a tour as a famous British person. <laughs> and then he became famous in America and went back to the UK as a famous person. <laughs> like, what a queen. Like, that's the biggest con. I love it. But so in the 1880s, he did a Louisville stop. And I read this little Cur Louisville Courier Journal, the paper I grew up reading, this little article about it from the 1880s that mentioned these young men who came with green carnations in their lapels. And I thought, who were those young men in Kentucky in the 1880s? And what was the community that could be constitutive enough of meaning that they could use that symbol to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm obsessed. <laughs> and I don't know what this book is gonna be, but um, I mean, it's, I'm so grateful because now I feel like my childhood is not just something I have to run from. It's something that I can, you know, reclaim. And again, like not deny, but try to make useful, try to make meaningful. Hi, thanks for coming Hi. to Philadelphia. Oh, my um, pleasure. My name's Aiden Brett. Um, my question is, well, inevitably, it's like a statement and then a question, but I, um, I was fortunate enough to read, I think, three of these short stories in the New Yorker or other forums beforehand. And when I was reading Cleanness, I have to admit, initially, I was worried, um, although obviously I'm an avid Rereader, I'm an English teacher. Oh, I, um, bless you. I was, I was worried because I wanted this book so badly, mm. and I wanted it all to be new, and so I had this worry for whatever reason. But obviously, I, I read it as arranged, and I just found that in those stories they were not just recontextualized, but reconstituted, which is a word mm. that then came up here, um, mm. in amazing ways. Um, particularly the final story. The, you've been talking tonight about how even over the course of one sentence, things shift. And it was just sort of these things that I remember from the first time I read the final story of uh, you know, the character kind of punching the kid as he's flexing yeah. and the way that gestured back to these S&M scenes, et cetera. It just all became brand new. My question is, um, what was, and I know you've referenced this sort of singing influence, but how did you decide on the order? And I'm so moved by the last story and interested if you could reveal like how you decide, were there a lot of back and forth to yeah. decide how that got there? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, the structure of the book is really strange, you know, and um, there was a lot of questioning of, of how we should talk about the book and what we should call the book. Um, there are nine sections. Um, the sections are kind of autonomous. As you say, some of them, several of them have been published separately. Um, 
but they're all the same narrator. Many of them are continuous in terms of character. And um, so there was a sense, you know, I think there was a certain desire on the part of the publisher, um, my publisher, who I love, to, um, to call it a novel. Because if you call something a novel, it has a different kind of fate in the world. Um, that didn't feel right to me. But it also didn't feel right to me to call it a story collection. Um, and they let me publish it as a book of fiction. But in my mind and in the ideal world that I would like to inhabit, um, you know, all of my ideas about structure come from music. And this sounds really pretentious, and it is, but it also is true that I think of this as a song cycle. And I think of it actually as a leader cycle. Like I sang a lot of Schubert, and my model for this book is something like Schubert's very brilliant Winterheise cycle. I think of the chapters of this book as centers of intensity that are then arranged in a kind of constellation by which I mean they are not stitched together in the way that scenes in a novel would be. They are not related to one another in terms of chronology or in terms of the cause and consequence of plot, but they are held in place and brought into relation by what feel to me like lines of force. And there are, and to me, the thing that demanded or that governed their arrangement are things like harmony, key, mode. Um, the first thing I knew, it was Gospodar, it was writing Gospodar, which is this long scene of a sexual encounter, a sadomasochistic encounter told from the perspective of a submissive. As I wrote that, when I had written it, I knew I had to write a companion scene, which would be a long, drawn out, um, story long, single sex scene of a sadomasochistic encounter told from the perspective of the dominant. I wouldn't write that for years. But the fact that Gospodar called it into existence, called into existence the little saint, made the book exist, brought the structure. I knew that at the heart, I wanted to tell the love story that is the center of this book, which is a story of a transformative love, a kind of love that the narrator thought he would never get to experience, a love very different from the kind of love he experiences in What Belongs to You. Um, I knew that that would be in the center. I knew it would have a beginning, a middle, and an end. That would be chronological. I knew that by the time we reached it, we would know the whole arc of it. We would know it had ended. We would know it had ended with a kind of devastation for the narrator that draws him to the abyss of Gospodar. Figuring out the order of the first and third parts was really hard. And it did involve, um, again, I couldn't think of it in terms of chronology. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. But I find that I can, like, with art, I can't figure anything out. Like, if I could figure it out, I wouldn't have to make art, you know? <laughs> like, I make art because my other tools for making meaning, my tools for figuring things out, like logic and reason and argument, they aren't sufficient. I need other tools. And so it was about, um, you know, experiment, feeling it out, finding out what worked, discovering this kind of mirror structure that, that the chapters have now. But I love what you say, that you read some of these stories individually and experienced them one way, but that in constellation, I feel very strongly they are transformed. Gospodar is not complete without the little saint. You know, they tell, it's not that they tell a single story, but it's that they are complementary plumbings of an abyss, you know, mm -hmm. or plummetings into an abyss. 
So it, thank you for what you say. It's very beautiful. Hi, welcome. Hi, um, thank you. I was thinking, I was moved um, by what you said that you felt lacerated by your father using faggot, right? And, um, and then I'm going to jump and say it was, you brought up the 90s, and I guess that was the ACT UP movement. Yeah, sure. Um, and I, I found, uh, you know, I was around in the 90s. That scared me, the ACT UP. I didn't like sure. that type of uh, provocation or whatever they would do, although I did agree with them when they protested when Bush came to town. But um, I wondered if it made me think, like, a lot of my friends had difficult issues with their parents, and I wondered if that pushed them more to, like, you know, the ACT UP movement. Uh, I think when I was a kid, like, I had to counsel my dad. I mean, uh, he would take my two older brothers to a baseball game and take me to buy matchboxes and then apologize for not buying me a ticket hmm. for them. But I'm like, but dad, I don't like baseball, hmm. you know? And I mean, I was really young. I think I was six or seven having to say that. So um, I'm just kind of curious on your thoughts. It doesn't sound like... Um, Maybe you've reconciled with him. And then I was curious about um, if, you know, any thoughts about uh, how, you, how you got along with your mother, if, if she was in the picture at all, and if she was at least on your side or anything? So, I mean, the, what, I, what I heard in the beginning of, of your comments was in, about, um, you know, this question of maybe a relationship between one's early life and, um, maybe the stance one takes towards authority or towards oppression. And, you know, um, the question, which has always been a tension in the movement for queer rights, as it has been a tension in every movement for minority rights, between a more kind of accommodating, gradualist um, approach and a more demanding, um, disruptive approach. You know, my feeling about that, and my feeling about that in activism in general, is that um, both are necessary, that it is a kind of dialectic, and that, um, you know, to me, the members of ACT UP are extraordinary heroes. And what they were confronting was a world in which everyone they loved was dying, and in which there were things that could be done. There were things that the government could do that would extend their lives. And the government was refusing even to acknowledge that they were dying. And I think, in the face of a government that was saying, who cares about this disease? It's just killing faggots. I think going into a church and shouting during mass and throwing condoms at the sacrament, maybe that's disruptive. It seems to me a remarkable act of restraint in the face of the absolutely criminal inaction of the United States in the face to the, of the crisis that was AIDS, and that is a continuing inaction. In the United States, the CDC estimates that if you are a young black man who has sex with men, you have a one in two chance of becoming HIV positive in your life. That is the highest transmission rate in the world that is higher than Sub-Saharan Africa. In the face of that, I think ACT UP lying down in the street and saying, you will not get to have business as usual. I mean, that seems to me heroic. Um, so you spoke a lot about, and I believe you said that it was like, not something that you could argue with yourself or would like to be argued with, so I'm not trying to argue here. 
Um, I wasn't trying to no, cut know, off anybody. But, you no, can no, argue. I, I mean, no, bring no, no. it. But I, I also, I love, I love that concept that there are, like, everyone subjectively has these pillars that, like... Temperament. They, yeah, yeah, and, like, you can try to, like, the world can try to educate you out of them, but you're just going to subject it, like, you're going to bounce back to, like, what you've been taught or yeah. what you couldn't, and you didn't choose that you were taught that. Um, but that this, like, struggling with dichotomies, I wonder, talking about radical queer theory, has, like, non-binary gender identity or, like, trans identity helped you loosen up those dichotomies a little bit? Just the knowledge that, like, we have had this primary dichotomy of, like, femme and mask that's, like, at the core of the world, but we're starting to get rid of it a little bit. Mm. Has that helped you, like, in your work, loosen up any of the, like, other tensions that you feel? Because I know it has for me personally, but and I wondered if it would also be helpful for you. Because when you talked about desire to like negate yourself, I, I don't know if that's a fundamental human thing or a trauma thing, but I really relate to it in that way. And I feel like it might be a cultural dichotomy that is not a universal dichotomy. Well, right. And so um, the thing to me, one of the things that I really love about being an artist is that I don't have to make arguments and that, you know, arguments are not how I move through the world. I would say, though, um, queer theory has been really central to my life. And as I was saying, you know, there is a tradition, a trajectory of queer thought that goes from Socrates through Judith Butler and Audre Lorde and Tim Dean that sees in sex the possibility of a radical reimagination of sociality. I will also say that the very theorists who laid the groundwork for a radical rethinking of the dichotomies of gender come from an intellectual tradition that has meant an awful lot to me. Like Judith Butler, whose Gender Trouble is one of the books that just set the, you know, the, the sort of intellectual framework. Well, one of Judith Butler's primary engagements is with Heidegger. Heidegger is working in a philo philosophical tradition that owes a great debt to the via negativa, to apophatic theology. Apophatic theology is a tradition of attempting to think through negation in a way that destroys the binary of negation affirmation, which is what I was trying to talk about before, that sort of in negation one finds affirmation. And what, you know, what I hope my book tries to dramatize is exactly the breakdown of a dichotomy of like cleanness and filth. And instead to say that, oh, actually in cleanness we find filth, in filth we find cleanness. You know, um, to me, um, so, um, you know, apophatic theology, um, this is a really simplified version, so don't repeat it, but it's, its sort of central apperception is that when we talk about God, we have a problem because God is infinite and language is finite. And anything we say about God will be a limitation of God in a way that is unacceptable. And so we can't say God is X, we have to say God is not X. Oh, but there's a problem. Because if we say God is not X, we're limiting God and trammeling God. And so we can't say that, so we have to say God is not not X. Oh, but there's a problem. We have to say <laughs> God is not 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 X, etc. Well, that's kind of and that really is the model of thinking that goes through deconstruction that queer theory takes on that allows us to try to break down the binary of male, female, mask, femme, gender. Now, that to me is precisely what I'm talking about, what one does with a double bind. I do think, and again, it's actually not important to me to argue whether this is a universal part of the human or whether it's just part of my equipment, my temperament, when I look at the human, I see double binds. And my question is, it seems to me clear that I cannot solve them. It seems to me clear I cannot break them. How can I mobilize them? 
How can I try to make them productive? Well, maybe I can say, not, 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 not. When I read Heidegger, I don't understand him. <laughs> I can't argue with him. But I do feel, well, and I'll say this also, when I read Augustine, who's one of my favorite people to read, or when I read Meister Eckhart, or Marguerite Perret, or Simone Weil, I'm an atheist. I'm affirmatively, aggressively, celebratorily, like, I mean, I love being an atheist. <laughs> I don't believe in God. And yet, I think Augustine has so much to teach me about myself. I think Simone Weil has so much to teach me about myself. I believe in them like I believe in poetry. A poem doesn't have to be true. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That's obviously false. <laughs> it's also banal. But in the system that is that poem, it lights up. It becomes electric. When I read Heidegger, I don't understand him. But I feel that somehow the mechanism of his sentences, like interlocks with some deep gears in myself and slightly shifts them. And that that feels exciting and transformative. And what I'm trying to do in my fiction, you know, what is knowledge in fiction? How can I know whether something is right? Well, not by reason. Maybe the best knowledge I have is something like pleasure. And what Heidegger does, what Marguerite Perret does, what Meister Eckhart does, is please me. Like, alter me just slightly in a way that produces pleasure, and that's something that I seek to do in art. And maybe that tiny alteration in the mechanism of myself is actually a meaningful transformation. Thank you both, uh, both so much for being here. Um, I wish every queer person could have heard this conversation because I think a lot of what you said about uh, pride uh, sort of forcing people to turn a blind eye to shame and a blind eye to the realities of growing up queer uh, made a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people uh, should, should hear that. So thank you so much. Um, you. On that note, I wonder, um, what you think about groups like log cabin republicans or maybe queer people who aren't necessarily um sort of fitting in with this sort of like pride like you have to be this way you have to be this way you have to be this way or else we're going to ostracize you from the gay community i wonder what you think of uh groups like that people who just you know don't quite fit in like log cabin republicans yeah or, or similar groups <laughs> um. I mean, I'm afraid I have strong feelings about Republicans of all stripes <laughs> at the moment, you know. Um, I think if you put children in cages, um, you don't warrant um, much in the way of attempts at intellectual engagement, you know. I think you should be stopped. Um, if I transform the question a little bit and think about, say, um, the desire to be post-gay, you know, the desire to say, actually, it's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. We don't need these categories anymore. Again, I don't know that I have much to say about that. I mean, it's a fundamental principle of my life that um, we don't get to tell anyone else how they should identify. We don't get to tell anyone else what should be important to them. Um, you know, I will say, though, that a, a sort of companion piece, oops, a kind of companion piece to that desire, you know, not to be caged by identity, which, I, I mean, I, I, I don't mean to sound uh, sardonic about it. I mean, I, I, I understand, or I can, I imagine that I understand something of, of, of what they mean. But there's also, you know, not very long ago, there was a kind of essay that went a little viral that was like a, an essay by a gay person, I've blocked out who this person was, um, by a gay person against gay history, sort of saying, um, we don't need to know about AIDS. Mm -hmm. We don't need to know about, you know, these sort of 
sad stories of sad queers being oppressed, um, that in fact, that feels like it gets in the way of myself. You know, it kind of gets in the way of my desire to feel that my identity is not a cage if you keep talking to me about the Nazis persecuting queers or the 1950s purges. Um, I have very little patience for that. And you know, this desire to imagine that we are original, to imagine that we are the origin of ourselves, this desire to imagine that we can be independent of the structures that enable our lives, of that history. Um, I do feel, you know, I was a high school teacher for seven years, and I do feel like I want to sit down those gays and have a little talk. You know, because everything, everything that I am able to do as a queer person in the world, let's be more specific. My whole life as a queer writer, the fact that I can write a book and come to Philadelphia and do events and talk to you and be reviewed in places and be seen and have it be read and have it be taken seriously in a way that, say, James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room was not taken seriously. You know, you read the reviews of James Baldwin that came out with very few exceptions, like Joyce Carol Oates, isn't it amazing that Joyce Carol Oates reviewed Beale Street back in the day <laughs> and like saw what it was, saw what Baldwin was? But these dismissive reviews. And you don't have to go very far back. In 1999, when John Updike reviewed Alan Hollinghurst in The New Yorker, The New Yorker, our magazine, The New Yorker, <laughs> and he called him relentlessly gay. And he said that books about gay sex did not have access to the dignity that even frivolous, unserious, promiscuous, swinger party, John Updike's novel couples like heterosexual romps have access to because they have access to the ancient sacralized structures of marriage and child rearing. 1999. Um, the fact that I don't have, that like, I mean, The New Yorker would never publish John Updike saying that about cleanness or about what belongs to you. That's because of generations of queer writers who didn't get to be reviewed by Dwight Garner in The New York Times, but on the shoulders of whom my whole career rests. And not just my career in terms of its public face, but also the access that I have to the resources of literature. They created the technology with which I attempt to think my life. You know, to say, I don't owe them anything. To say, they get in my way of my sense of my freedom and, you know, lack of being bound by identity. Um, I don't have very much patience for that. We owe immense gratitude to generations of queers who never got to sit on a stage in Philadelphia and have people ask them about their work. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, guys. Thank you.